All right, we have a few people and it is 6.30, so why don't we get started? Okay. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. My name is Anna Withers and I'm the Farmer and Resource Development Manager for Springfield Community Gardens. And we are a nonprofit based in Springfield, Missouri, whose vision is a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. The workshop tonight on growing crops and produce food safety is generously sponsored by the 2501 grant, or I'm sorry, the CFP grant from the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And our speaker tonight is the University of Missouri uh, MU Extension Horticulture Field Specialist, Patrick Byers. I'll let him introduce himself further in a moment, but just some housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions throughout the night, please ask as we go. You can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type in your question during the presentation. Patrick's really good about stopping periodically to answer them. So please feel free to ask as we go along. And there's also a chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Please only use that for the comments because it helps me keep track and make sure we get all of those questions answered throughout the night. Once you leave this workshop, a screen will pop up with a link to a post workshop survey and that survey is used in SCG's reporting to the USDA, and it also helps us provide meaningful workshops to you in the future. So we would greatly appreciate it if you could just take a few minutes to fill that out after the workshop. And if you want to refer to this workshop later, it will be available on SCG's agriculture workshop playlist on YouTube by the end of the week. And I will be sure to add all links and resources that I mention into the chat in just a moment. And I believe that's it for me, if you want to take, take us through it, Patrick. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Anna. And um, tonight we're going to talk produce, food safety, and growing crops. And my name is Patrick Byers. I'm a horticulture field specialist for the University of Missouri Extension. And I'm based in Southwest Missouri in Webster County. And uh, a, a portion of my uh, appointment is focused on produce, food safety. I've worked in the produce food safety arena for about nine years now. And most recently, uh, I've been a lead trainer for the Food Safety Modernization Act Produce Safety Rule Training. And uh, that's given me uh, just a, a really good uh, understanding of produce food safety as it relates to the way that we grow and handle crops here in Southwest Missouri. So we're going to spend uh, our time together tonight focusing on growing crops. And I, I don't know how many of the folks on the call are, or on the workshop are actually farmers. If you are, um, I, I congratulate you and thank you for the service that you provided to, to, uh, to the uh, consumers of, of Missouri. But I also congratulate you for being on the call with us because that demonstrates to me that you're interested in growing safe crops. Now, as we go through the material, uh, please enter any questions you might have in the Q&A. We'll also have a chance to, at the end, to unmute and and ask additional questions. So um, I, I do welcome interaction, hope that this uh, presentation becomes more of a conversation and discussion than a monologue. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with the presentation. <clears throat> okay, Anna, can we see the, uh, the presentation now? Yes, it looks good. Okay, and is the audio good? Sounds great. Okay, very good. Well, again, tonight we're going to talk about growing crops and produce food safety. I've been with University of Missouri Extension for going on 14 years now, and most of my work is, is in service to specialty crop growers, those uh, farmers who are growing fruits and vegetables as a commercial crop. I also have an interest in homesteading and, and home food production and love to, love to visit about that as well. And half of my time in more recent years has been devoted to produce food safety. So tonight we're going to, to focus on specialty crop production and how that intersects with produce food safety. As Anna mentioned, um, this program is in collaboration with uh, Springfield Community Gardens. And Springfield Community Gardens is a grassroots nonprofit organization in the greater Springfield area whose vision is a community where everyone has access to healthy local food. And uh, Springfield Community Gardens oversees a network, I believe, of 19 community gardens in our community. And they also have a very innovative uh, farmer incubator program. So if you are a farmer, particularly a new farmer who's interested in uh, specialty crop production in the Springfield area, reach out to Springfield Community Gardens and, 
take advantage of their resources. And our third partner is the USDA. The USDA has generously provided support for tonight's workshop. And uh, the uh, USDA has a number of services and programs that are available to farmers of all scales, not just large crop farmers, but also smaller scale specialty crop farmers. And I encourage you to reach out to, uh, first of all, the Farm Services Agency. There's an office of FSA in every county in Southwest Missouri. And that's your, your uh, starting point to access the support available from USDA. Two of the USDA branches in particular, the NRCS or Natural Resources Conservation Service and the RMA, the Risk Management Agency, have programs that will be of interest to specialty crop farmers. So check them out. Uh, more information is also available on the farmers.gov resources website. So here's our outline for tonight. Uh, we'll start with a bit of introductory material, but we're gonna spend most of our time in looking at some of the risks that are associated with crop production as they relate to produce food safety. We'll talk about soil and soil amendments. We'll talk about using water during crop production. We'll talk about animals. We'll talk about equipment and tools. And then we'll, we'll end up with a discussion of how the people who work with produce pose a risk and how we can manage all of these risks and grow crops that are safe for the people who enjoy uh, the, the fruits of our labors. Okay, let's start out with uh, some introductory comments. Now, uh, the uh, crops that we grow are not grown in a laboratory. They're grown on the farm. They're grown in the field. They're grown in greenhouses. They're grown in high tunnels. And we recognize that these environments are not sterile environments. These are environments that are, that are, are open to some of the risks that might be present just because of the way that we grow crops. And these risks are related to a number of different things. Uh, I mentioned some of them in the introduction, but uh, the interface of the amendments that we use to grow crops, the water that we use to support crop growth, the uh, uh, hands that manage and harvest the crops that we grow, and the uh, soil that supports our, our crops growth, all of these can pose food safety risks. And we'll spend the rest of our time together this evening talking about how we as farmers can minimize those risks. The contamination sources that we're concerned about are, are several. And these are, are um, related to, again, the way that we grow crops. And certainly the, the soil can, can pose a risk, the way that we use water, the buildings, equipment, and tools that we use, the intersection of growing produce and animals can pose a risk. And this, these might be wild animals or they could be domesticated animals. And then of course, as I mentioned, human hands touch produce and, and there's a risk there as well. So we'll be looking at all of these different uh, contamination sources and, and talk about how we can minimize the uh, risks that are, are related to produce food safety. Let's start our discussion with, with pre-plant considerations. Before we put the first seed or transplant into the high tunnel or into the field, there are some things that we should be thinking about relative to produce food safety. And this, this picture is, is a, an example of, of looking at pre-plant considerations. We can see produce fields in the background and we can see livestock in the foreground. And anytime there's an intersection between livestock and produce, there's a risk there. And part of our pre-plant consideration is, is to weigh the risk that might be posed by the way we farm and, and whether or not we have animals on our farm and where we place produce fields relative to, to animals. So we're gonna be looking certainly at field location. We'll be looking at wind patterns and topography, thinking about, uh, you know, is there any way that contamination can move from an area where perhaps there are animals onto a produce field? We'll be looking at the way water moves. Again, the, it can be a, a significant risk if we have livestock in an area where runoff is likely to move contaminated water into a produce field. We'll think about the previous uses for the field that we're planning to plant with produce. Has it been used for grazing? Are there issues present there such as landfills? Has manure been applied to that field? It doesn't mean that we can't use a field based upon previous uses, but we certainly want to think about how best to, to manage any risks that might be present. And again, just to kind of give you a feel for what's coming in the presentation, uh, manure applications, good case in point, we frequently use manure to support crop growth, but we have to use manure carefully because manure can carry microbial contamination. And it's a good recommendation to allow an interval between the time manure is applied to a field and the point where we harvest a crop from that field. The recommended intervals are 90 or 120 days. 
120 days, if we're growing a crop that is a at-risk crop, you know, for example, something like salad greens or strawberries that are close to the soil, and 90 days for a, for a less risky crop, you know, perhaps something like trellis tomatoes or apples or blueberries, where the part of the crop that we're going to harvest and enjoy is separated by some distance from the uh, soil. We also want to think about certainly the impact of domesticated animals. And uh, produce food safety does not mandate that we can't have livestock on our farms, but it does uh, give us uh, some thoughts on, on how to manage the risks that are posed by the uh, presence of animals close to where we're growing crops. We want to think about adjacent land uses. Uh, we we may, not have, may not have control over adjacent land uses, but we can certainly develop risk management strategies on our farms when we look at adjacent land use. So are, are there other farmers around us that are producing animals? Um, are there manure storage areas? Are we in a residential area? More and more, we're seeing uh, uh, urban farm development, uh, especially in Greene County. And we have to be thinking about the uh, land uses adjacent to these urban farms. And there's some really unique uh, situations that I've had a chance to work with relative to urban farms, and not, not the sort of situation you would find in a rural area. And then we want to think about wildlife risks, you know, how, how animals move onto and off of our farms. You know, is the farm located in an area where there, there are known travel patterns for, for animals such as deer? Uh, what is the likelihood of fecal contamination in a field? We can assess all of these risks before we plant. Now let's turn our attention to soil and soil amendments. And this is a kind of a good picture here. You know, this, this person is applying uh, an amendment to a production site. Now, as we look at that, what is that amendment? Is it manure? Is it compost? There certainly is a difference between manure and compost as we'll discuss here in a moment. But anytime that we apply an amendment, particularly an amendment that comes from animals, we need to be thinking about risk management. So a soil amendment is any chemical, biological, or physical material that we deliberately uh, amend our soil with. And we do this with, with goals in mind to improve the uh, soil, we, to support plant growth, to support plant development. Amendments uh, can also be applied to reduce soil erosion and sediment runoff. Uh, there's many different types of soil amendments. And you know, these first three statements, um, amendments are a valuable part of growing crops. You know, using amendments such as manure and compost are very much uh, encouraged. Uh, using manure, for example, is a great way to take a waste stream and divert it to a useful purpose on the farm. And, and these amendments, as we see here, have definite benefits, but they also can present produce safety risks. And part of being a good farmer is to assess these risks and develop practices that reduce any risk that might be associated with a soil amendment. Okay, let's look at some of the, uh, the soil amendments and the relative risks that they present. Um, as far as a significant microbial risk, primarily we're talking about biological soil amendments, and especially those that include raw or untreated manure. Now, synthetic soil amendments, things such as chemicals, certainly can impact food safety, not from, particularly from the standpoint of biological issues, but from the standpoint of of uh, uh, actual toxicity from excess use or improper use. And when we think about using these amendments, both biological and synthetic, we really want to assess risks. And we want to think about what type of amendment we're using and, and how we're using it from the standpoint of risk management. Okay, so how do we assess those risks? Well, first of all, what type of amendment are we using? If it's raw manure, that carries a higher risk than if it's composted manure. If it's a chemical amendment, that carries risk as well. Which crops receive the soil amendments? Are we applying these amendments to fresh produce or are we applying them to an agronomic crop or, a, or to a pasture setting? Where obviously the, the, the opportunity for a person to be exposed to contamination is, is much less. But if we're applying it to fresh produce, then we need to be thinking carefully about the risk. When do we apply the amendment? Uh, what is the interval between when we apply that amendment and we harvest a crop off of that field or out of that bed. What time of year do we apply it? Do we apply it in the fall so there's plenty of time for, for decomposition and, and uh, the elimination of organisms before spring planting or are we applying it closer to harvest? How do we apply it? Do we apply it as a surface application? Do we incorporate it in the soil or do we inject it? Typically, 
Those amendments that are incorporated or injected pose less risk than surface applied amendments. And then how much and how often are these amendments applied? Uh, obviously, there can be environmental impacts if we apply too much of an amendment, regardless of whether it's a, a biological soil amendment or a chemical amendment. So we want to be thinking about all of these factors and assess how they, they uh, apply to our farm and the risks that might be associated with them. Uh, some more thoughts on, on chemical soil amendments. Again, from the standpoint of biological contaminations, minimal risk. Most uh, fertilizers contain very little, if any, um, uh, of the pathogens that can make people sick. Now, we can't consider them 100% safe. Obviously, there is risk. Um, you know, certainly, chemical risk is, is present. We want to be sure that anyone who's applying a chemical fertilizer understands how to apply it properly and also wears the appropriate personal protective equipment. We want to make sure that, that uh, the applicator follows all of the instructions that are present on the label of the material. And we also want to be sure that, that any chemical fertilizers are properly labeled and properly stored. And a note here, uh, we're not talking about harvest and post-harvest, but you do not want to store fertilizers in areas where you're going to be handling produce after harvest. This is unfortunately a common situation that I see on farms. And it's related to the fact that most farms just don't have enough storage area. But try to find an area to store chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and other chemical uh, items well away from where produce is being handled. <clears throat> now, what about pre-consumer vegetative waste? Well, what is pre-consumer vegetative waste? Well, it's waste that comes from plants. And uh, this is waste that is <clears throat> developed perhaps in the course of of cleaning up a planting after the harvest is done, or perhaps it's waste that is developed as a crop such as lettuce is prepared after it's been harvested. Now, even though there's no manure involved here or no animal uh, amendments of animal origin, pre-consumer vegetative waste is not zero risk. Occasionally we have issues related to chemical, uh, the presence of chemicals on these, these, uh, this plant waste. There could also be physical hazards such as uh, you know pieces of wood other things that could could injure a person and then there, there occasionally are biological hazards and then again some examples of pre-consumer vegetative waste uh, produce food prep waste out-of-date vegetables and food products that have been removed from their packaging typically lower uh, risk but but definitely not zero risk what about non-manure based soil amendments of animal origin? It's not just manure that, that uh, we use from the standpoint of amendments that come from animals. Other amendments might include bone meal, blood meal, feather meal, and fish emulsion, particularly for organic growers. These are important nutrient sources during organic production. Now, in most cases, these amendments are processed uh, in such a way to eliminate pathogens. If they are not, then they must be considered as untreated biological soil amendments of animal origin. So if you're purchasing any of these amendments, you definitely want to check to see if they've been processed to eliminate pathogens. And in most cases, the suppliers of these non-manure based soil amendments will provide documentation upon request. But again, make sure that, that if you're using these amendments, they have been processed to make them biologically safe. Untreated soil amendments. So this is where the risk is, okay? So an untreated biological soil amendment of animal origin is considered to be high risk. Uh, these amendments carry a strong likelihood of, of having contamination from the organisms that make people sick. They have not been treated to reduce or eliminate pathogens, as is the case with the amendments we just saw, or as we'll talk about here in a moment, properly processed compost. All of the following amendments would be considered untreated. Certainly raw manure. Also that, that manure pile that has some age on it, uh, sometimes we call this aged or stacked manure, but unless it's been properly treated, it too is considered to be the same as raw manure. Untreated manure slurries, untreated manure teas, agricultural teas with supplemental microbial nutrients, and any soil amendment that we mix with raw manure. A good example here would be, would be uh, uh, manure from, from barns or stables where the bedding is mixed with the manure. But again, remember that all of these types of amendments are considered untreated and carry a high risk from the standpoint of contamination and they must be used properly. 
Now, what about treated soil amendments? What about soil amendments that at the start carry risk? We treat them in such a way to make them safe. And indeed the answer is yes. Treatment does require, however, a controlled process such as composting that breaks down the organic matter and reduces pathogens. Now, the primary way that we treat soil amendments is through temperature. And you know, for example, uh, anyone who's had experience with composting knows that, that as the composting process takes place, the pile heats up, okay? And if the composting process is properly managed, it will reach a high enough temperature that it eliminates or reduces pathogens, okay? Uh, sometimes other factors contribute, chemical or biological factors contribute as well. Now, the bottom line is that it has to be a properly regulated process. So only a treatment process that's been scientifically validated will really give us confidence that pathogens have been uh, eliminated or reduced in that waste. And what this means is that uh, if you can't document that your, your uh, compost pile has been through a scientifically validated treatment process, then there's a strong likelihood that it still contains contaminants and, and uh, must be thought, uh, treated and, and managed as raw manure. And if you're interested in on-farm composting and developing a scientifically validated process, please reach out. I'd love to visit with you further about how to do this. I will say as a general rule, most cases on-farm composting does not provide enough heat for a long enough period to ensure that the soil amendment is adequately treated. Now we, we also need to think about how we're using these amendments. And you know, certainly we can, we can take steps to reduce risks while we're applying them. First of all, if there's an option to apply soil amendments that contain manure to something that we're not going to actually eat fresh, this is definitely a risk management strategy. So applying it to a, to a crop that we don't eat fresh or to a pasture area or to, a, a, for example, a, a portion of a bed or a field that's going to be in cover crops. This is a great way to utilize uh, amendments that contain manure. A second approach is to maximize the time between application and harvest. And I think we revisit this, but again, remember the 120 and 90 day intervals. Another risk management strategy is, is not to contact the part of the crop we're going to harvest with manure. Okay, so for example, there's definitely a risk with, with side dressing with manure while crops are in place in the field. And then we wanna minimize the risk to adjacent produce crops if we're field spreading manure. So for applying manure to a pasture or to an area that is not in crops, we wanna do everything we can to, to uh, risk spreading it. And certainly it can be the physical movement, the throwing of manure, but it could also be the wind blown movement. If we look at this picture here, we can see a situation with a front end loader dropping a load of manure into the back of a dump truck, but notice that, that there is uh, some wind blown or airborne movement of manure from that scoop. And that could be very easily blown onto an adjacent produce field and cause contamination. Again, back to the, the minimum application intervals. Uh, the uh, produce safety rule, which is the federal legislation that, that governs safe produce production does not include or does not contain minimum application intervals. Uh, the general recommendation is to use the intervals that have been developed by the National Organic Program. These are called the NOP intervals. And as I mentioned before, they're 90 days for crops that have low risk and 120 days for crops that have high risk. Some other things to consider, untreated soil amendments. We must not apply raw manure directly to the harvestable portion of the crop. Looking at this picture, for example, if there was a manure application that contacted these heads of lettuce, then those heads of lettuce would not be able to be harvested and, uh, and used as food. Treated soil amendments. Again, uh, if we can, can, can document to, to, uh, to, uh, that, that the amendment, the raw amendment that contains manure has been treated with a scientifically validated process, then that manure app or that former manure amendment, now compost amendment, is considered to be microbially safe. It can, it can be used up to the, uh, the day of harvest because it is a much, much safer amendment. And what about some thoughts on how we handle manure? Uh, it's a good practice to have designated equipment and tools when we're applying manure. It's very easy to cross-contaminate uh, 
with, with tools and equipment that have been in contact with manure. And a good example would be, let's say that we have a wagon that we use to haul manure and, and we do so, and then we don't adequately clean and sanitize it. Then we use that same wagon to, to haul and distribute compost, you know, something that is microbially safe. Well, we've inadvertently contaminated that compost with any residue that might be present in the wagon from the manure. So if we're going to use the same equipment and the same tools, we need to have an SOP in place to clean and sanitize equipment and tools before we use them for any other purpose, such as uh, uh, microbially safe soil amendments or, or for uh, uh, use with fresh produce. It's also good practice to think about the pattern of operations on our farm. You know, there are certain areas on the farm that are just prone to having having contaminants present, you know, animal uh, areas around animals, for example, or areas where there's a lot of foot traffic. We want to think about how we can manage that risk by the way that we do chores, or perhaps the way that we, we change shoes as we move from an area with animals into a produce management area. There are, are, are ways to, again, to, to manage any risk that might be associated with areas that, that are contaminated. <clears throat> Now some thoughts on worker training. We'll talk more about people uh, towards the end of our, our workshop this evening. But again, it's, it's uh, just a fact of crop production that hands are gonna touch produce. We wanna do everything that we can to make sure that those hands and those people who work with produce are not a source of contamination. So first of all, anyone who handles soil amendments, uh, both treated and untreated, really needs an understanding of the SOPs, the standard operating procedures, for properly competing, completing tasks where they're going to be handling raw manure or compost. We wanna make sure that clothes, boots, and gloves are clean before handling produce, uh, certainly at the beginning of the day, but also as we do chores during the day that involve, anim involve animals, we wanna have in place a process to decontaminate ourselves. If we look at that lower picture, here's a situation where um, this worker's pants and uh, shoes have become visibly contaminated. And before working with produce, the worker needs to change shoes and change clothes before uh, moving into an area where produce is. We always want to pay attention to our feet. It is so easy to spread contamination on our feet into produce fields. And so we want to be very conscious of where our feet have been. And then washing hands. Uh, you know, we, we've all heard about washing hands probably much more than we want to during the, this era of COVID. But if anything has come out of COVID, it's, it's an increased awareness of the benefits of washing hands. And I really can't stress the importance of, of good hand washing practices when it comes to, to managing the risk during crop production. So wash hands whenever they may have become contaminated before moving back into managing produce in the field. Okay, Anna, do we have any questions at this point? No, nope, you can go ahead. Okay. As I mentioned, please enter questions into the chat. And at the end of our time together tonight, we'll have, have a, a kind of an open mic session with questions and answers. Okay, now let's turn our attention to water use during crop production. <clears throat> now, we'll start with a discussion of irrigation and water use. Um, irrigation is one of the primary ways that we use water during crop production. It's not the only way because we also use water when we mix up uh, tanks of spray, we use water as we clean equipment uh, during crop production, and we use water, of course, as we decontaminate ourselves, particularly as we wash our hands. But let's talk a little bit about irrigation and water use. <clears throat> now, recognize that lots of factors can impact the quality of water, and we'll talk about what these are here in just a moment. We also recognize that, that oftentimes we use more than one source of water on the farm and we use that water in different ways on the farm. And then we have to recognize the risk the water carries with it. It's, it's easy for human pathogens to be introduced into water, and water is a very effective vector at spreading problems around after it's been contaminated. And especially if we use that water for a, a crop-wide process such as irrigation. And again, produce safety is impacted by all of these things. We wanna be thinking about all of these things as we consider the risk associated with production of water. Okay, so there's three primary things that we think about when we look at risk. First of all, is where that water comes from and its quality. Secondly, how we're using that water. And third, how close we're using that water 
to, to planting or to harvest. So let's talk about the, the first point here in just a, a bit, and then we'll dig deeper into that here in a moment. But when it comes to production water, you know, as far as the source, there are three primary sources for water on our farms. Sometimes that water arrives at the farm delivered by a public water authority, a county, a city, uh, where that water is frequently tested. Sometimes we draw that water from below the soil surface, uh, in, in most cases through a well. And then finally, we sometimes utilize surface water, water that's coming from a stream, a lake, a pond. Another thing to consider is how frequently the quality of that water is evaluated. With public water, there's a, a water authority that is regularly testing the water to make sure that it's safe. When it comes to groundwater or surface water on farm, then it becomes the uh, responsibility of the farmer to test that water to understand its quality. The application method, are we using the water in such a way that it doesn't actually contact the part of the crop we're going to harvest? Uh, for example, if we're using uh, drip or trickle, oftentimes that water does not actually contact the above ground part of the plant. So if the part we're harvesting is above the ground, then trickle or drip is a very safe way to use water from the standpoint of potential contamination. And then again, timing, are we using it at planting or are we using this water close to harvest? So from the standpoint of the probability of contamination and, and water source, you know, when we look at this particular slide, it, it really points out nicely that there's a much lower risk in using a public water supply and a much higher risk in using a surface water source. And for, for obvious reasons, in most cases, public water has been treated one way or another, and it's also regularly tested. So if there are any problems, they're rapidly identified and corrected. Groundwater, water that comes up from below the surface is protected from contamination from the environment. But just because it's coming from below the soil surface does not necessarily mean that it's safe water. It doesn't mean that there's no risk. And the only way to clearly understand the safety of groundwater is to test it. And then surface water, water that is open to the environment carries the highest risk and for obvious reasons, it's very easy to contaminate a surface water source. You, know, you think about the potential ways that a stream or lake could be con contaminated, there are many. Turning our thoughts to the way that we're using irrigation water, overhead water where we're throwing water over the crop at the sprinkler is a higher risk application method because we're directly applying water in such a way that the entire plant contacts the water, the above ground part and the below ground part. So it's unavoidable that the harvested part of the crop is going to be, uh, is, is going to be contacted by the irrigation water that we're using. And obviously if we're using overhead or sprinkler irrigation, then water quality becomes a primary concern. <clears throat> Flood, which is surface or furrow, is less risky. The water is separated from the crop if the part that we harvest is above the soil but it's not completely without risk because certainly water can be splashed out of a furrow or a surface application onto the crop. The safest application method for most crops is drip or trickle. And this of course is where water is applied directly to the soil under lower pressure and typically in lower amounts uh, at, at a given time. And except in the case of root crops, the produce generally does not directly contact water that's applied with a drip or a trickle system. There's other compelling reasons for using drip or trickle. It, its application keeps plants dry, which reduces foliar diseases. And it's also a very efficient way to use water, especially if water is in, in lower supply. And if we look at these three pictures, we can clearly see the, the differences in risk. The upper picture, sprinklers throwing water over the entire crop. The middle picture, that's furrow irrigation with and again, less risky, but not without risk because water can be splashed out of that furrow. And then the bottom picture, a drip or trickle uh, system. And particularly when a mulch such as a plastic film is uh, added to the production system, uh, further separating the water from the crop, this is, is, uh, enhances the, uh, the uh, effectiveness of this approach from the standpoint of risk management. So again, the, the method of irrigation certainly plays a role in managing risk. Again, the bottom line is less contact with water equals lower risk. And when you're thinking about the way that you're irrigating, are you applying water in such a way that, that the water contacts the crop or the part that you're going to harvest? If your answer is never, then that risk from, from the water is very low. 
If the answer is yes, then you want to think about the type of commodity, particularly the quality of the water and how close you're using that water to harvest. Now, we recognize that, that the, the, the pathogens that make people sick, the bacteria, the viruses, and the, uh, the uh, uh, parasites that make people sick that are found on produce may die off over time. Now, this is not an exact science. There are lots of environmental conditions that can influence die-off rates. And these include you know, the drying off, particularly in, uh, in situations where uh, it's warm, and uh, dry pathogens tend to die out more quickly than in situations where it's cool and moist. The presence of sunlight, uh, pathogens that are exposed to sunlight and ultraviolet irradiation die off more quickly than those pathogens that are protected, uh, for example, in lower parts of the plant or on the soil surface. Temperature and humidity. Uh, high temperatures and low humidity tend to promote die off, whereas lower temperatures and higher humidity tend to reduce die-off rates. And then starvation and competition. Uh, these pathogens, uh, in many cases, uh, from the standpoint of survival, require some sort of food source. And if there's no food source present, then they, they uh, can essentially be starved off. There's also competition with, with uh, harmless or beneficial organisms for uh, sites on plants. And if there's a strong presence of these beneficial organisms, they can actually outcompete some of the uh, pathogens that make people sick. But keep in mind that pathogens can be protected on the plant. And this is one of the reasons that we really can't say with certainty how long it takes for pathogens to die off. You know, For example, a bacteria that are present within a head of lettuce are certainly protected from all of these environmental conditions that I just mentioned. And they will survive longer than say um, bacteria present on leaf lettuce or, or in the open environment. And there's even situations where pathogens can regrow on a plant. Now, the bottom line is from the standpoint of managing risk and exposure of produce to pathogens, avoiding contamination is by far the best, the best uh, approach to managing risk. And so much of what we talk about when we talk about managing foodborne illness risk, it comes down to avoiding contamination, practices that we can put in place that prevent or avoid contamination. Now, some good practical things to think about from the standpoint of water and risk management. We should be once a year taking a look at the way that water is distributed on our farms. We should be looking at the source of the water. We should be examining wellheads. We should be looking at uh, uh, surface sources and understanding if there is a risk of contamination. We also wanna think about how we move water from the source to the point where we're using that water. In some cases, these are, are buried distribution systems. In some cases, they're on the surface, but we wanna make sure that we've mapped all of these distribution systems and that we inspect to make sure there's no leaks, to make sure there's no breaks where contamination might move into the system and then be distributed to our crops. Uh, we wanna keep water sources free of debris, trash, domesticated animals, and other hazards. A uh, practice as simple as fencing livestock out of ponds or streams can have huge benefits from the standpoint of managing the risk associated with using surface water. So again, a good practical thing is to think about your water source and make sure that that's not a source of contamination and your water distribution system to make sure there's nothing going wrong with your system. If we look at this picture, here's an example of a, a surface water distribution system. And you'll notice that that T, that, that dead leg that comes out to the left on where the connection is made there, where there's some water leaking. This is an area where contamination can very easily enter that system. And then once it's in the system, it then moves down the line and is distributed to the crop. So again, in this case, it would have been better to use an elbow rather than a T at this point to redirect the distribution of water. Now, really the only way that we can evaluate water quality is through water testing. And it's in, in the farmer's interest to develop a water quality profile in all the water sources that they are using on the farm to grow crops. Now, um, the water quality profile, again, is useful because it gives you certainly a snapshot, snapshot at the point at which the water test is collected. But over time, if you have a, uh, a plan in place to regularly sample and test the quality of water, you develop a profile that helps you understand 
the uh, expected level of contamination. And if you start to see spikes or if you start to see contamination where there was not contamination previously, something has changed. And now it's time to figure out what changed and to correct that problem. But if you don't test your water, you don't have that data in hand. and It becomes very difficult to effectively monitor the quality of water. And this is the case certainly with surface water testing as we see in this picture, but it's also the case with well water. Well should be tested at least once a year. And in fact, more frequently is a good practice with wells. And so test that water. Uh, at present, the uh, University of Missouri Extension has in place a free water testing program to help farmers uh, understand the quality of their water. And this particular program is managed through the uh, Missouri Department of Health. The entry point is the county health department. They can provide water testing kits and uh, uh, the water sample is collected. It's submitted for evaluation. The program pays for the uh, sampling fee and then the test report comes back to the farmer. Now, the established indicator of contamination in water for produce is generic E. coli. Now, the standard water test typically reports back in a reading of what's called total coliforms. And total coliforms is useful, not as useful as generic E. coli, but total coliforms is useful because if a test comes back with total coliforms, it indicates that there is some way the bacteria is entering into that water source. Now, total coliforms are not all harmful. There are lots of, of bacteria that are measured in a total coliforms measure that are not harmful. If we move to a more rigorous test and look at fecal coliforms, this is better. And uh, if you have a test that reports back in fecal coliforms and there is some level of fecal coliforms, then there's a strong likelihood that there has been contamination from a manure source. Okay. Now, does that mean that, that using that water is going to, to lead to people getting sick? Well, it may or it may not because there are coliforms found again in feces that are not necessarily pathogenic to humans. But if we look at generic E. coli, which is again, an even more rigorous test, generic E. coli presence in a water test is a very strong indicator of contamination with organisms that will make you sick. So this is why in most cases, generic E. coli is used as the established indicator in water testing. Now you could go one level more rigorous and test for pathogenic E. coli, those particular strains of E. coli that do cause human illness, but this is a very expensive test and typically is not recommended. So again, even though E. coli is not a direct measure of the presence of human pathogens, it is a strong indicator. And it's the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, standard measure that we use to assess whether or not a water source is of good enough quality for its intended use. Again, assess your water quality now. Uh, if you're testing your water, continue doing so. If you're not testing, continue, consider starting to test. There's never been a better time to test your water than right now. It's important, again, to follow good agricultural practices to protect and maintain water quality. And again, uh, a routine, regular testing of your water is going to help you identify and reduce risks. So if you're not testing your water, now is a great time to start. Do we have any questions related to water? Kenneth? Oops, sorry, uh, nope, not at this time. Okay, uh, again, please enter any questions you might have into the chat. Now let's turn our attention to animals. And isn't this a cute kitty? And I'm definitely a cat lover, but I'm not a lover of cats in produce fields. And we have to recognize that animals carry a risk. Certainly a risk is found in their, their manure or their poop that they leave behind, but just their very presence can lead to contamination because animals on their bodies carry contamination. So we wanna be cautious about the presence of animals in produce fields. Animals carry the same things that make us sick. You know, pathogenic E. coli, salmonella, Listeria monocytogenes, all of these can be carried on animals and can be present in animal manure. And animals can be very efficient at spreading human pathogens. Certainly they can deposit poop or feces in the field. And then they also can spread that contamination as they move. You know, a fecal contamination can be present 
on the body of an animal such as a deer. And as it moves around through a field, it can spread that contamination. So this can lead to a situation where we can, we can, we can see visible evidence of contamination by seeing poop or perhaps uh, 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 evidence of browsing, that sort of thing. But there may be contamination that we can't see. So again, it, it's a better practice to do everything we can to keep animals out of produce fields. Now, that being said, it's very difficult to completely eliminate animals from produce fields. Birds and small animals frequently travel unnoticed. You may have noticed on my opening slide, there was a pepper plant there that had a hole chewed in the side of the pepper fruit. Well, this was damaged from a mouse. And how often are we going to see mice traveling into a produce field? If we use fencing, we have to recognize that even the best fence can be breached one way or another. And fences are not very helpful at keeping birds out. Complete exclusion is not possible. Does this mean we shouldn't make a good faith effort to exclude animals? Of course not. But we recognize that animals are very difficult to control. And this slide, uh, again, just illustrates some of the risks associated with managing food safety on a farm. You know, again, we can have uh, birds flying over a field and leaving droppings. We can have uh, uh, domestic animals that have escaped from confinement moving into produce fields. We can have wild animals moving into the field that leave feces behind. We can have runoff. There are various ways that we can have food safety problems on the farm related to animals. And it definitely can be a complex issue. Now, does this mean that we should eliminate all wildlife and all wildlife habitat around our farms? Of course not, of course not. Uh, we, do want, we do recognize that there can be an aesthetic value and, and even a beneficial value of having wildlife on our farms, beneficial relative to managing pests and, and, uh, and other issues. So we're certainly not advocating the elimination of wildlife or wildlife habitat. I also have to recognize that in many cases, wildlife is protected by county, state, or federal law. And when we think about management options, these may be limited by these laws. Now, wildlife on the farm can be resident or transient. You know, some, some types of wildlife are present 12 months out of the year. This would be the case with something like deer or raccoons, whereas other problems may be transient, uh, migrating birds, for example. And then any case we have a situation where wildlife are in close association with human activities, it can pose greater risks. You know, for example, if, we're, if we have a farm that's located near a dump, frequently there are uh, seagulls or, or other uh, animals present feeding at that dump that can then become a problem on adjacent farms. So we want to recognize that, that uh, if there are areas that, that have a concentration of wildlife, this can be an area of greater risk. Now, how do we assess the risk relative to wildlife? Uh, looking at that upper picture, I, I don't know that any of us in Missouri are too concerned about alligator contamination, but certainly there are other, other uh, uh, sources of contamination among wildlife and, and animals that we want to be concerned about. So the first thing to think about is, do we find wildlife feces in our production fields? Uh, as we assess a field before we plant or as we work in crops, do we find poop in there? How often? Is it widely distributed? Is it actually in contact with produce? So again, a very important way to assess risks. Secondly, uh, is our farm in an area where there's large number of animals? You know, do we have herds of deer? Do we have flocks of migrating birds? I think most of us, if we were being brutally honest, would say that in many cases, this is certainly true. I know in, in Webster County, where I farm, we have upwards of 20 deer uh, per square mile found in that part of, of Missouri. And this is a lot of potential contamination that can enter a produce field. And then we want to think about our management practices that can limit wildlife contamination of uh, produce fields and water sources. There are things that we can do, and that's part of our risk assessment. Now, how do we monitor for wildlife activity? Certainly during the growing season, this is an important time to monitor. We're gonna be watching ever vigilant for feces and evidence that animals have been in our fields. We certainly want to evaluate the risk of fecal contamination on the produce. And obviously uh, the risk with a tree crop is less than it would be say with a root crop or something that's growing close to the ground. And if we know that there is wildlife in the area, if we've seen deer, if we've seen evidence of raccoons, if we've seen geese flying in or, or whatever it might be, we wanna take that into account as well. 
And we want to think about things that might attract wildlife to the area. You know, as I mentioned, adjacent land uses such as a dump or a, uh, a cattle feedlot situation could draw large numbers of wildlife into an area that's adjacent to a produce field. A very important time to monitor for wildlife activity is immediately prior to harvest. At uh, this point, we're getting close to harvest and any contamination becomes a very serious issue. So we're gonna be watching closely for evidence of fecal contamination and, and other signs of animal activity. And this is a time, of course, where we wanna be very rigorous in assessing risks. And certainly if we have crop that has been contaminated with manure, we're not going to harvest that because there's no way in most cases to clean that crop up. We also wanna decide if we have to, to just eliminate a portion of the crop or if there might be a, an even wider situation. This is a picture of a feral hog. Feral hogs are particularly troublesome. Certainly they, they do a lot of damage, trampling and ridding, but they have the unpleasant habit of pooping and moving around as they poop. So they can, uh, you know, a single uh, episode of, of, of depositing poop or manure can be a widespread issue in a produce field when feral hogs are involved. Let's turn our attention to domesticated animals. Again, thinking back to that cat on the opening slide of this section, that cat was invited. That cat is a, uh, a, a uh, part of the farm. It's, it's in some cases a member of the family. But we have to recognize that livestock and pets can harbor human pathogens. Now, sometimes we use domesticated animals as part of production practices in fields. For example, working animals. Uh, there are many farms where, where horses, for example, are used as draft animals on the farm. Perhaps these animals are used in wildlife management, uh, guard dogs, for example, to keep deer out of a field. And sometimes we use domesticated animals to graze crop residues or culls at the end of harvest. So it, there is a situation where we invite domesticated animals into the field. But if we're inviting those domesticated animals into the field when crop is present, we have to have in place strategies to manage the risk that's associated with those animals. So if they're working animals and they're allowed into the field while the crop is present as part of the harvest process, what might we do? Well, as an example, let's develop a system during harvest where we don't actually have the animals in the field uh, where the crop is. Perhaps we can have a drive lane, perhaps the, uh, the uh, animals can be on the outside of the field. These are ways that we can manage risk. Uh, sometimes we have a situation where, uh, where the, the animal might be working the field early in the crop production cycle, and we have a pooping situation where we have the animal pooping in the field in amongst the crop. Well, at that point, we need to stop, and we need to figure out what we're going to do. In most cases, we'll want to remove the, uh, the poop that the animal has deposited. Uh, it's best practice to use a clean shovel for this and to place that poop into a bucket and then carry it from the field. Uh, you think about the, the possibility for disaster if you pick up a shovel full of poop and start walking across the rough field. It's very easy to trip or to otherwise shake that poop off the uh, shovel and all of a sudden a, a point problem becomes a more widespread problem. So uh, have a plan in place to manage any problems that might be related to working animals in the field. And then we wanna think about workers too that are, that are present with these animals in the field. You know, As we handle animals, during the course of, of using these animals in crop production, we become contaminated, our hands, our clothing, our shoes, and, and also equipment. And so we wanna have in place a plan to minimize the risk associated with, with workers. Uh, a good example would be, again, if, if uh, horses or some other animal are used during harvest, let's have a dedicated person who manages the animal. And then let's have others who are not in close contact with the animal, but actually harvest the crop and move the crop to the uh, the wagon or whatever it is that the horse is drawing. So again, to, to revisit what I just said, the best way to minimize risk is to keep the animal out of the field while the harvestable portion of the crop is present. And again, if we use the, the animal close to harvest, as I mentioned, let's figure out a way to keep the animal out of the field. And let's think about how we ourselves can prevent ourselves from becoming contaminated. Let's have in place standard operating procedures that focus on things like hand washing, cleaning and sanitizing tools, and then practices to complete after handling animals. This might be something like changing clothes or perhaps taking off a pair of coveralls and putting on a, a clean pair of coveralls before we move into handling produce. 
some thoughts about pets. Um, in most cases, we wanna keep pets out of produce fields. Pets carry a risk and particularly cats. As I mentioned, I'm a cat lover, but I know that cats have that sneaky habit of burying their poop. And frequently the, uh, the uh, loosened soil in a production field is irresistible to the cat from the standpoint of leaving poop behind. So we wanna be cautious about the presence of pets in production fields. If you invite visitors to the farm and they bring their pets with them, this can lead to some, some difficult situations because people like to be with their pets, even when they're visitors on a farm. So before inviting people to the farm, let them know that please leave your, your pets at home. Or if pets are going to come to the farm unavoidably, let's have a place where we can, can um, allow the pets to be uh, present, but excluded from produce fields. You know, For example, a, a holding area where pets can wait for their their uh, owners to come pick them up when they're ready to leave the farm. Petting zoos. Petting zoos can be a challenge. Again, this is a deliberate invitation of animals onto a farm frequently in close contact or close association with produce. And then the hands that touch these animals, for example, in a pick your own farm, oftentimes then move into production fields and contact the crop. So if you have petting zoos, make sure that you have adequate signage to instruct visitors about your food safety policies and a critical component of the interface between petting zoos and pick your own is hand washing sinks. And all people who contact animals must wash their hands before they move into production fields. Okay, do we have any questions related to animals? Um, just one from me, Patrick. I'm I keep thinking about what you said earlier and how, you know, obviously Ermin urban farming operations have different considerations being in the city. So, you know, there might be more sewer issues or more people around or something, but um, any specifics regarding like animals and keeping, um, keeping produce safe in the city, in more of an urban versus rural area? Well, you know, it's interesting when you think about the, uh risks associated with animals in an urban versus a rural setting. Some of the same problems that are present in rural areas are present in urban areas. For example, we have lots and lots of urban raccoons and, and urban foxes and urban possums. Um, frequently in urban areas, we have more problems with things such as feral cats or feral dogs. But the, the same risks that are found in rural areas can be present on urban farms as well. And oftentimes the same strategies to manage these risks are the same on urban farms as they are in rural farms. I would say that an important consideration in an urban farm is adequate fencing. And frequently urban farms are smaller scale than rural farms. And you know, obviously there's an expense related to fencing and that expense is more manageable on an urban farm. But a, a fence to exclude things such as uh, feral dogs is helpful. Um, it's important to be particularly vigilant with pre-harvest crop inspections on urban farms. Again, because feral cats are, are pretty ubiquitous in most of our, our urban areas and, and they're, they're pretty tricky in, in the ways that they enter produce fields and then uh, leave poop behind that, that's buried. So be very vigilant relative to that. Frequently issues related to rats or mice are more of a problem in urban areas than they are in rural areas. This picture, we'll be talking about the pre-harvest crop inspection here in a moment, but this picture is uh, the same one I saw uh, on my opening slide. And, this was a situation in, uh, in a uh, high tunnel in an urban farm. And mice moved into that high tunnel uh, as the weather cooled and they began to feed on the, the uh, pepper crop. And you can see the chewing, the damage that was present here. Mice feces are very difficult to see and it's very easy to miss them. And even this level of damage might be easy to miss. So again, very important in an urban setting to be thinking about what some of the common problems might be and to be vigilant for for monitoring for those problems. That makes a lot of sense, thank you. Do we have any additional questions? Nope, not right now. Okay, let's talk about the pre-harvest crop inspection. Um, so we've done a great job of, of evaluating risk before we plant it, and we've done a good job of, of thinking about all the things we've discussed at this point in growing crops. Now it's time to, to prepare for harvest, and we wanna be especially vigilant at this point because Problems that are found at this point in the uh, crop production cycle can, can be uh, pretty serious issues relative to the risk for foodborne illness. Uh, 
Now the pre-harvest inspection is, is a chance to go out and look at the field before harvesting to determine, first of all, if fecal contamination is present. You know, we're, we're doing taking a close look at uh, crop to make sure there's no con direct contamination that we can see with our eyes relative to poop. We're also looking for evidence that there, there might be additional risk, uh, tracks, trampling, ridding, feeding. Looking at this picture here, this is a lettuce field that unfortunately had an incursion from feral hogs. And this particular field, unfortunately, the entire crop was lost. Certainly the, the damaged crop was lost, but the presence of feral hogs led to widespread contamination from poop. And it was distributed across this field. And so the entire field was unfortunately lost. Keep in mind that once produce has been contaminated visibly with, with poop, it cannot be harvested. Uh, corrective actions are helpful. So again, if we do have a situation where you've identified uh, a poop risk, you know, we, we've seen a visible contamination from poop, then we have to also think about a no harvest buffer zone around that source that we've identified. Now, how wide should this zone be? Well, the uh, uh, federal legislation, particularly the produce safety rule, doesn't tell us what that is, but common sense and, and uh, again, just a, a concentration on risk management would encourage us to consider, first of all, how uh, the, the situation uh, as far as the characteristics of the poop. Is it poop from deer, which is very discreet and, and uh, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't really spread except if the deer moves? Or is it something like contamination from a cow? where the, uh, the poop is much looser and as it hits the ground can spread just from the splat factor. Has it rained since the, uh, the contamination occurred? Has there been, for example, tractor tires driving through it and further spreading it? All of these can influence the size of the buffer zone. Now, the buffer zone uh, can be anywhere from zero to 25 feet. Uh, typically, a reasonable buffer zone in most situations would be somewhere around three to five feet. But again, it's up to the farmer to decide what that zone should be. And it's always best to be conservative when, when uh, assessing risk in a situation like that. Okay, so corrective actions. What do we do if there's contamination? What if we've identified contamination? Well, if we've seen visible evidence of contamination, we don't harvest contaminated produce. That's just a bottom line rule to follow. If we do need to establish that no harvest buffer zone, again, the things we're gonna think about, uh, what size does it need to be? What crop is it in? What's, you know, what has the weather been like since it happened? Uh, how extensive is the contamination event? And uh, harvest equipment is a consideration here as well. This particular picture shows uh, actually uh, bear feces. A bear got into this field and left poop behind. It wasn't visibly on the crop, but it was in an area just adjacent to the crop. And in this case, the, uh, you can see the uh, flag there. The uh, farmer marked the uh, contamination spot with a flag, then removed the poop so that it wouldn't be further spread, put the poop in a bucket, carried it out away from the, uh, the produce field. Now the flag marked the spot where the contamination was so that workers would be aware of a, a known contamination site. And as they were harvesting crop adjacent to it, they would be particularly vigilant for any additional evidence of fecal contamination. And in this case, the uh, farmer established a uh, five foot no harvest buffer zone around this particular point of contamination. But again, the uh, size of the buffer zone is dependent upon these factors that we just discussed. Now, what do we do with the contamination? As I mentioned, it's a good practice to, to think about how you're going to handle contamination. Are you gonna remove it, leave it, bury it, or, or use some other strategy? In most cases, Farmers will remove the contamination from the field, taking care that additional contamination doesn't occur through the, uh, the, the process. As I said before, a designated shovel, pick up the poop, put it into a bucket, carry it. Um, well, first of all, mark the spot, establish the no harvest buffer zone, pick up the poop with the shovel, put it in the bucket, carry the bucket out of the field, wash and disinfect the, uh, the uh, shovel and then dispose of the poop in such a way that it doesn't cause additional problems. And then of course, document your actions. And looking at that lower picture, that's a case of, of rabbit contamination in a strawberry field. And again, this is tricky. You've got to be a good observer to find evidence of fecal contamination, but it can be, again, a, a serious situation. Okay, do we have any questions related to, uh, to uh, fecal contamination? 
Nope, not at this time. Okay. Now let's take a look just at some, some uh, this is kind of a little bit of a shotgun approach here, just looking at a few production practices that can be uh, effective ways to manage risk relative to, to fresh produce. Deterring wildlife. We can certainly use various approaches to keep wildlife out of production fields. Fencing or netting, as we see in the lower uh, center picture, can be very helpful. Uh, the, uh, the netting placed over a field can be an effective deterrent to, to birds. And wildlife fencing around the field can discourage uh, wildlife such as deer from entering the, the field. Uh, decoys, these can be effective as well. Falconry, that's a kind of a unique approach to, to uh, uh, managing wildlife, but it has been used to, with, with uh, success in deterring birds from berry production fields. <clears throat> Some other approaches to deterring wildlife, there are visual deterrents and noise deterrents. Um, looking at these pictures here, the, uh, the upper left, that's a propane cannon. And this cannon goes off at, at irregular intervals and the sound is a deterrent to certain types of birds. The center upper picture, this is a reflective mylar tape that vibrates and moves and, and reflects light in, uh, in, in fields and is placed in berry, uh, above berry plants and, and tree fruit plants and vegetables as well. The uh, inflatable that we see on the far right is a very effective deterrent. And these are being used more and more in produce fields. And again, they, they inflate at, uh, at irregular intervals. And in some cases, they also have a uh, noise deterrent associated with them as well. There are recorded bird distress calls that can be used to deter birds from berry fields. Uh, there are other approaches to tactile repellents and then relocation. I will say that, that uh, relocation is a regulated activity. And before undertaking trapping and relocation, check with your local authorities in Missouri, it's the Missouri Department of Conservation to understand the regulations that are in place relative to relocation. And recognize too that relocation typically is a lethal strategy. In most cases, relocated animals are poorly equipped to su uh, survive in the areas where they've been relocated. And in most cases, they end up dying. Equipment and tools. So we wanna maintain all equipment and tools in a clean and sanitary condition. This is especially the case as harvest approaches. <clears throat> Pruning and trellising to keep fruit up off the ground. Anytime we, we take a plant that normally would produce its crop close to the ground and move it to a vertical orientation so that the crop is further away from the ground, this is an effective risk management strategy. Trellis tomatoes, for example, or trellising peppers or uh, vine crops can be a very effective uh, risk management strategy when it comes to produce food safety. Again, removing the harvested portion of the crop away from contact with the soil is very helpful. Here's another picture of, of a trellis blackberry planting. Okay, now let's turn our attention to humans and some considerations relative to the people that, that work in produce fields. First of all, any person who is ill should not be working with fresh produce. Uh, again, people who are sick or show signs of illness are shedding pathogens and these pathogens can very easily contact produce. Now, when we talk about people who are ill, what does that, that mean? Well, some of the symptoms of illness that that uh, suggests that a person is, is in a situation where they could cause contamination would be nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, and jaundice. Uh, particularly if a person is losing bodily fluids through things such as vomiting or diarrhea, there is a strong risk of contamination of, of produce. So people who are sick should not be working with fresh produce. Very important to wash our hands before working with produce. And, <laughs> I've already talked about this once and I'll mention this as well, but it's very important that everyone who contacts produce on the farm during production understands how to adequately wash their hands. And there should be hand washing facilities at restrooms, at the field entrance and, and wherever else they're needed. Keep in mind that the use of a hand sanitizer alone is not a replacement for hand washing. Um, <laughs> This is the last time I promise that I'll mention hand washing. So how do we wash our hands? Well, first of all, we wet our hands with water. Then we apply soap and we lather our hands. 
want to be sure that we lather our hands for at least 20 seconds, and then we rinse our hands thoroughly with, with water. Now, keep in mind that the entire operation is using clean water, water that is drinking water quality. Then we dry our hands with a paper towel, and we turn the faucet off with the used towel, and then we throw the paper towel in a trash can. In most cases, it's safest to use single-use towels for, for drying our hands. Also important to recognize that the field is not a toilet. Um, I actually took uh, these comments here from, from a signage that I saw at a pick your own farm. Please don't water our plants. Uh, very important to stress to workers and to anyone who's invited on the farm to use the bathroom or a porta potty, not the field. Don't allow diaper changing in the field. It's, it's unavoidable that people, uh, I mean, people are going to contaminate their hands during the diaper changing process. And if they're in the field, they're less likely to leave and wash their hands before returning to the field. And then it's very important to wash your hands before picking fruits or vegetables. Certainly workers should understand this, but, but anyone who's invited to the farm, such as pick your own customers, the, uh, you, you should be insisting that they wash their hands before harvesting crop. A bit more about facilities. Uh, there should be an adequate number of toilet and sinks to meet workers and visitors need. The uh, OSHA requirement is that there should be one sanitary facility per 20 workers and this facility should be within a quarter mile of the working area. Make sure that you regularly service your facilities. No one wants to use a porta potty or a bathroom that is dirty, that has not been regularly cleaned. So make sure that they're serviced on a regular schedule. Uh, you should be checking daily to make sure that toilet and hand washing facilities are well stocked. And you should be monitoring your facilities every day, particularly during busy times of the year. As I said before, no one wants to use a bathroom that's dirty. Again, I mentioned this and I'll mention this again, make sure that you provide a sufficient number of toilets and sinks to meet the needs. Uh, Discourage eating, drinking, chewing gum, or smoking in fields. And the reason that this is important is that our hands inadvertently go to our mouth when we're eating, drinking, chewing gum, or smoking. And once our hands have been near or into our mouths, they are contaminated. And it's very easy then to spread that situation to produce as you're working with produce. So if, if, uh, if people wish to eat, drink, chew gum, or smoke in the fields, there should be designated areas that are away from produce fields where these activities can take place. What I frequently see on farms is a de designated break area where people can gather and then eat, drink, chew gum, or, or, or smoke. Don't litter in the fields. Again, litter has, in most cases, contacted people's hands, and litter present in the field can be a source of contamination. So uh, insist that all trash be placed in trash cans that are located outside of the produce field. Now, this is a consideration primarily with pick your own situations or other situations where people are invited onto the farm. In most cases, this is not an, a problem that is found on farms where the only people present are workers, but it is important that people be trained that all trash should go into trash cans. And don't feed wildlife. Feeding wildlife just encourages the presence of wildlife close to produce fields, which is definitely contrary to what we want to do from the standpoint of managing this particular risk. Very important to have a visitor policy. And uh, we've touched on some of those points as well. And if anyone has any questions about an effective visitor policy, please reach out. I'd love to visit with you further about this. Some general things to think about relative to your visitor's policy. Visitors, uh, growers must make visitors aware of the farm food safety policies. You know, things such as uh, here is where the toilet is, here is where the hand washing facilities are. I insist that you wash your hands before we move into produce fields. And certainly pick your own customers, but also uh, a, a school tour, for example, where you're inviting a class to come to the farm and learn about how you grow crop. This is an admirable thing, and I encourage farmers to do this. You're, you're teaching the next generation about farming. But anytime you invite someone onto the farm, there is a risk there. So the very least you should do to help manage that risk is to ask everyone to wash their hands. There may be areas on the farm where you don't want people to visit and make sure that they know about that. If anyone is ill, they should not be coming to the farm. 
they should be leaving their pets at home and they should be washing their hands. I promise not to say washing hands again, but I'm sorry. It is such an important aspect of risk management. Don't visit the farm when ill. This should be part of your visitor policy. Children should be accompanied by an adult. Again, children frequently don't understand the risks associated with, with activity and, and uh, behavior. And it's up to adults to be regulating the activities of children. And so uh, part of an effective visitor policy is to have in place a policy where children must be accompanied by an adult. And again, just an example of, of a, a portable hand washing station that can be moved around to different parts of the farm to accommodate farm tours or pick your own activities in a particular section of the farm. And some examples of signage. It can be very effective to post signage on places at the farm where people are entering the farm or where workers congregate. And by having signage in place, it reinforces the training that is so important. Uh, all, all people on, all workers on the farm should be trained in produce food safety. And then having signage reinforces that training. Okay, here are some resources relative to growing crops in a safe fashion. Uh, there are some, some wonderful videos that are available on the Kansas State University Produce Food Safety site on cleaning and sanitizing, wildlife control and produce safety, and biological soil amendments of animal origin. So check out these videos. I think you'll find them very informative. I'll also mention, and my contact information will be here on the last slide, but please reach out if you have any questions related to produce food safety. I'd love to visit with you further. If you'd like to have an individual consultation on your farm and produce food safety, I'm happy to do that as well. So with that, that is the, uh, the prepared material that I had for this evening. This would be a great time now to tackle any questions. Yes, and right now we don't have any that have come through. Very straightforward, and I know people will definitely appreciate that when they go to put in their uh, produce safety plans. In their yes, and, and again, anyone who's who's on the workshop, if you'd like to, and are, are they able to unmute, Anna? You know what? I don't think so with this one. We could set that up, I think, for the future, but right now it's okay. just closing panelists. Well, please, if you have any questions, we'll stay on for a few moments here and uh, enter them into the chat. I'd love to visit with you further about produce food safety. How many presentations do you think you've given on produce food safety before? And is it more than other topics? I would say not enough because it is such an important topic. You know, certainly we as farmers need to be thinking about these issues. And I've also given presentations to consumers and others who are not farmers, but obviously have a vested interest in produce food safety. So I've given lots, but there's still, there's still more, more uh, work to be done in, in sharing the produce food safety story and helping to be part of developing that produce food safety uh, consciousness that is so important, certainly to farmers, but to anyone who enjoys the uh, fruits of, of our labor as, as farmers. Yeah, definitely. Well, no questions have come in, so you must have explained it pretty clearly. Well, as we again uh, move into the future, if there is any way that I can help uh, anyone with produce food safety issues, please feel free to reach out. It's easy to find me and, and I'd love to visit with you further about, uh, about produce food safety. Thanks for your time, Patrick. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you all for joining us in tonight's workshop. Good night.